Toad, Part 2 Do not weep, little one, the old lady comforted me. Jesus and the Virgin love you. She smiled and patted my head. To my mother, she said as though just realizing it, Your baby. Somehow that day changed everything. I wasn't afraid of my great-grandmother any longer. And once I began spending time with her on the porch, I realized that my father had also begun directing increased attention to the old woman. Almost every evening, S.A. Gringo was sharing wine with Grandma. They talked out there, but I never did hear a real two-way conversation between them. Usually, Grandma rattled on, and Daddy nodded. She'd chuckle and pat his hand, and he might grin, even grunt a word or two, before she'd begin talking again. Once I saw my mother standing by the front window watching them together, a smile playing across her face. No more did I sneak around the house to avoid Grandma after school. Instead, she waited for me and discussed my efforts in class gravely, telling Mother that I was a bright boy, muy inteligente, and that I should be sent to the nuns who would train me. I would make a fine priest. When S.A. Gringo heard that, he smiled and said, He'd make a fair to Midland, holy roly roller peacher, too. Even Mom had to chuckle, and my great-grandmother shook her finger at S.A. Gringo. Oh, you devil, Charlie, she crackled. Frequently, I would accompany Grandma to the lot, where she would explain that no fodder could grow there. Poor pasture or not, the lot was at least unpaved, and Grandma greeted even the tiniest new cactus or flower, flowering weed with joy. Look how beautiful, she would croon. In all this ugliness, it lives. Oildale was my home, and it didn't look especially ugly to me, so I could only grin and wonder. Because she liked the lot, and things and things that grew there. I showed her the horned toad when I captured it a second time. I was determined to keep it, although I did not discuss my plans with anyone. I also wanted to hear more about the bloody eyes, so I thrust the small animal nearly into her face one afternoon. She did not flinch. Hola, señor sangre de ojos, she said with a mischievous grin. ¿Qué tal? It took me a moment to catch on. You were kidding before, I accused. Of course, she acknowledged, still grinning. But why? "'Because the little beast belonged with his own kind in his own place, not in your pocket. "'Give him his freedom, my son.' "'I had other plans for the horned toad, but I was clever enough not to cross Grandma. "'Yes, ma'am,' I replied. "'That night I placed the reptile in a flower bed cornered by a brick wall S.A. Gringo had built the previous summer. "'It was a spot rich with insects for the toad to eat, and the little wall, only a foot high, must have seemed massive to so squat an animal.' Nonetheless, the next morning when I searched for the horned toad, it was gone. I had no time to explore the yard for it, so I trudged off to school, my belly troubled. How could it have escaped? Classes meant little to me that day. I thought only of my lost pet. I had changed his name to Juan, the same as my great-grandfather, and where I might find him. I shortened my conversation with Grandma that afternoon so I could search for Juan. What do you seek? the old woman asked me as I poked through flower beds beneath the porch. "'Praying mantises,' I improvised, and she merely nodded, surveying me. "'But I had eyes only for my lost pet, "'and I continued pushing through branches and brushing aside leaves. "'No luck. "'Finally, I gave in and turned toward the lot. "'I found my horned toad nearly across the street, crushed. "'It had been heading for the miniature desert "'and had almost made it when an automobile's tire had run over it. "'One notion immediately swept me. "'If I had left it on its lot, it would still be alive.' I stood rooted there in the street, tears slicking my cheeks, and a car honked its horn as it passed, the driver shouting at me. Grandma joined me and stroked my back. The poor little beast, was all she said. Then she bent slowly and scooped up what remained of the horned toad and led me out of the street. We must return him to his own place, she explained, and we trooped, my eyes still clouded, toward the back of the vacant lot. Carefully, I dug a hole with a piece of wood. Grandma placed Juan in it, and covered him. We said, and our father, and a Hail Mary. Then Grandma walked me back to the house. Your little Juan is safe with God, my son, she comforted. We kept the horned toad's death a secret, and we visited his small grave frequently. Grandma fell just before school ended, and summer vacation began. As was her habit, she had walked alone to the vacant lot, but this time, on her way back, she tripped over the curb and broke her hip. That following week, when Daddy brought her home from the hospital, she seemed to have shrunken. She sat hunched in a wheelchair on the porch, gazing with faded eyes toward the hills or at the lot, speaking rarely. She still sipped wine every evening with Daddy, and even I could tell how concerned he was about her. 
It got to where he'd look in on her before leaving for work every morning and again at night before turning in. And if Daddy was home, Grandma always wanted him to push her chair when she needed moving, calling, Charlie, until he arrived. I was tugged from sleep on the night she died by voices drumming through the walls into darkness. I couldn't understand them, but was immediately frightened by the uncommon sounds of words in the night. I struggled from bed and walked into the living room just as Daddy closed the front door and a car pulled away. Mom was sobbing softly on the couch, and Daddy walked to her, stroked her head, then noticed me. Come here, son, he gently ordered. I walked to him, and uncharacteristically he put an arm around me. What's wrong? I asked, near tears myself. Mom looked up, but before she could speak, Daddy said, Grandma died. Then he sighed heavily and stood there with his arms around his weeping wife and son. The next day, my Uncle Manuel and Uncle Arnulfo, plus Aunt Chincha, arrived, and over food they discussed with my mother where Grandma should be interred. They argued that it would be too expensive to transport her body home, and besides, they could more easily visit her grave if she was buried in Bakersfield. They have such a nice manicured grounds at the green lawn, Aunt Chincha pointed out. But just, just when it seemed they had agreed, I could remain silent no longer. But Grandma has to go home, I burst. She has to. It's the only thing she really wanted. We can't leave her in the city. Uncle Arnulfo, who was on the edge, snapped to Mother that I belonged with the other children, not interrupting adult conversation. Mom quietly agreed, but I refused. My father walked into the room then. What's wrong? he asked. They're going to bury Grandma in Bakersfield, Daddy. Don't let them, please. Well, son, when my horny, horny toad got killed and she helped me to bury it, she said we had to return him to his place. Your horny toad? Mother asked. He got squished, and me and Grandma buried him in the lot. She said we had to take him back to his place. Honest, she did. No one spoke for a moment. Then my father, S.A. Gringo, who stood against the sink, responded. That's right. He paused, then added. We'll bury her. I saw a weary smile cross my mother's face. If she wanted to go back to the ranch, then that's where we have to take her, Daddy said. I hugged him, and he, right in front of everyone, hugged back. No one argued. It seemed suddenly as though they had all wanted to do exactly what I had begged for. Grown-ups baffled me. Late that week, the entire family, hundreds it seemed, gathered at the little Catholic church in Koalinga for Mass, then drove out to Arroyo Cantua and buried Grandma next to Grandpa. She rests there today. My mother, father, and I drove back to Oildale that afternoon across the scorching west side desert, through sand and tumbleweeds and heat shivers, quiet and sad, we knew we had done our best. Mom, who usually sat next to the door in the front seat, snuggled close to Daddy, and I heard her whisper to him, Thank you, Charlie, as she kissed his cheek. Daddy squeezed her, hesitated as if to clear his throat, then answered, When you're family, you take care of your own.